welcome folks who are in this space. Um, it's nice to be here physically, and it's also nice to have folks who are joining us online. Um, I'm excited to be talking to you today about emergent strategy and how uh, we are practicing this in our organization. So I'd like to introduce you to someone, this young learner on the screen. She has big hair in this picture. So it's a school picture, actually. A lot of hairspray in the front. It was in the 80s. A lot of hairspray was used in the 80s. So shout out to all the 80 babies in here. She was born in El Salvador in 1980 and migrated to the United States in 1983, mainly because there was a war taking place there. Being in a new country was challenging for her family, but like many um, immigrants that come to America, uh, her family had big goals and dreams of creating new opportunities. Getting a good education was particularly important in her family. However, school was quite challenging for her since English was a second language. In many ways, her experiences required her to constantly adapt, adapt to new things, adapt to new spaces. Despite these challenges she faced growing up, like being an immigrant, growing up um, in a low socioeconomic class, becoming a young mother at 19, and being a woman, she became the CEO of Equity Institute. EI is an organization whose mission is centered on supporting communities, specifically school communities, in building spaces that are grounded in equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. My name is Carla E. Vigil. I don't think this is a surprise to many. I think you probably all figured out the second I was talking that this is me. My personal narratives, lived experiences, have prompted me to develop an intimate relationship with adaptation. And this relationship with adaptation is intrinsically tied to how we practice the idea of emergence in our organization. So who are you? Who's in this space? I would imagine, or I want to speak actually to you all, I would imagine that you are uh, not, not maybe nonprofit leaders, maybe um, educational leaders, perhaps you're entrepreneurs, co-founders, or you're thinking of starting up your own organization. Or my fave, educators. But all people here, I would expect, want to lead work in, ed the, in the educational space with an intention, intentional focus on equity. So why are we here? EDIA, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Anti-Racism, can be seen today, specifically during this time, as controversial, political, divisive, complex, emergent. And because of this, it's generative. It's constantly changing, and the way we work with it constantly change. So you might be asking yourself, how do we respond to change? How do we practice emergence in our work? I want to talk to you about a radical approach. It's an approach about being and leading that I first discovered in the writings of Adrienne Marie Brown, who's a doula, an activist, an author, a healer, among many other things. She's influenced by the works of people like Nick Obolensky, Gracie Lee Boggs, and Octavia Butler. Additionally, university professor Henry Mitzberg has conducted significant research on the concept of emergence in organizations. For today, in our time together, I'm specifically talking about Adrienne Marie Brown's interpretation of emergence strategy and the core principles we've adopted in our work. According to Adrienne Marie Brown, emergence strategies is ways for humans to practice being in good relationship with each other and with the space that they navigate, to practice complexity, to grow a compelling future together through relatively simple interactions. Emergent strategy is how we intentionally adapt to an ever-changing world. Trust me, we've all been practicing this the past few years. 
In a world of chaos that we're living in today, a world of uncertainty, constant sh shifting, that we're experiencing real unexpected situations, the practice of emergence has helped us work with change rather than against it. So to begin, I'm gonna talk a little bit about complex systems and how it exists all around us. Emergence occurs when complex systems and patterns arise through simple interactions or from simple interactions. I'm standing here in front of you today. I run an org that has required many simple interactions in the past four years, many connections of parts that have brought me where I am today. They show up, complex systems show up all around us, even here, right now, in this comp in conference. Can you imagine how many small interactions between people had to take place to make this conference happen in the midst of a pandemic? I'm sure there were thousands of small interactions between people that were meaningful and intentional. Let's look at a few other examples. This time in nature, complex systems exist in nature. We get to witness this every single day. I'll give you some specific examples about how this happens in our natural world, and I think you can figure it out by looking at the screen. But birds, for example, they migrate together, they work to prepare a way to leave a certain place and arrive to another to survive and thrive. There are many things happening between the birds, communication, coordination, but they're aligned enough to maintain a shared direction that's cohesive, cohesive enough to move them together. Another example are ants. Ants work together to move something that weighs 20 times more their body weight. But eat, every ant relies on the work of others to produce their own work. So they're working, again, collectively to build sustainability. The last one is the mycelium, one of my favorites. A mycelium is a fungus that grows underground. It starts as a root and then it connects with other roots to break down plant material to create healthier ecosystems. So as you can see, there are many different interactions taking place around us every single day. Adrienne Marie Brown talks about this in her book. She talks about biomimicry. And biomimicry is when we practice what we see taking place in the natural world. So replicating a design that already exists and applying it in our work. She talks it, about it more in a liberation kind of way, um, which I encourage you to, you know, if you ever can, if you have a chance to read it, it's, it's really interesting and I believe that it helps you think about what systems can be used to solve problems that you're having with people. So how do we begin to practice emergence? We use core principles in order for us to really embody the way we shift and the way we change. The first one is we start small because small is good and small is all. And yes, I might be a little bit biased to loving small things. I am pretty small in size, so I do think small is good and small is all. But if we practice at a small scale, we then set the pattern for the whole system because the larger is a reflection of the small. At EI, we started about six years ago with no plan. Did not want to start an org. It was just two people that were co-founders, that were former teachers, with two lived experiences, those lived experience very much grounded in our identities, very much grounded in some marginalization, but with big ideas on how to address problems in education, especially those impacting black, indigenous, and people of color. We slowly grew with intentionality. We met with other groups of, um, with groups of other former educators in a small room and be began to have a discussion on how to create space that really supports us, that allows us to innovate, that allows us to network, and allows us to lead in our, in our work. Fast forward many years, 
and it's blossomed to where it is today, an organization that is thriving and growing. But also just recently, we were able to use this principle of small is good and small is all. For example, we've been grappling with this idea of remote working. We're a young org, we have about seven employees, and we're really big on culture. And so, should we go remote? Should it be hybrid? That's the question we've been asking. And truth be told, we're not really sure because we know that it's harder to build culture online. However, we decided to hire our first remote employee. Shout out to our first remote employee who's in this space and it's from Austin, woo woo, in the back. We don't have a plan yet or a policy, but we, what we do have is the ability to build trust, to be in good relationship with our new team member who we already had a number of different dinners and hung out already and had great conversations to begin to think about what does this model look like and, where, and how do we create a culture that does embody the values and the principles that we believe in so that we can move forward in this work. So every single interaction that you engage in cont contributes to the whole. All the decisions you make contribute to this larger picture. We can't do small is good, small is all, without being able to value trust and to move at the speed of trust with the people that you build with and the people that you serve. So the second principle I'm highlighting here is to move at the speed of trust. This is a big one. Trusting within ourselves allows us to trust in others and to build meaningful interactions that can lead to transformative change. Again, our organization was not born with deliberate planning. Intentionality, yes, we wanted to solve problems. But not so much about, we, you know, we didn't have a strategic plan, we didn't have a clear vision, but instead we practiced emergence. And that meant making changes and pivoting at the real time. And it meant more importantly, that we started off by listening to the people that we were serving, listening to the people that were closest in proximity to the problem, educators, other leaders in the space, students, parents. They wanted this work, they needed this work, and so we made it happen. And more importantly, in everything that we do, we do center folks who have historically been marginalized, underserved, or underestimated, as Arlen Hamilton would say. We've not only been able to acknowledge the people that we work with to gain trust, but we've moved slowly with care to think about the programming that we're developing, to practice, to practice the values about the people and checking in with the people before we created anything that served their needs. Moving at the speed of trust means knowing also when to pause to hold space, and we do this, again, by listening, by also listening to our bodies and our guts and our intuition. I'll go to the next one. The last principle that I wanna talk about is my favorite, and it's because we practice this, not only in our, have we've seen it practiced in our organization, but just really all around us. And this one is about change. So change has been the theme for the past two years. In pandemic years, it feels like six years or something like that. I don't know, time has been a blur for many of us. So this last core principle that I wanna talk about is how we've been able to shift and change. Change is constant, be like water. When we first started, this was also the theme of, in our org. Anybody, anybody that came into the org, we said, how are you in relationship with change? Can you work with change? Or do you work against it? Because we were changing everything as a startup. We didn't know what we were doing, really. I mean, that's the truth. We were building the ship as, what is it? Building the ship as you sail, something like that, right? And we were just learning. 
We were learning, but we were also emerging, and we were being real to ourselves, to our stories, to the stories of the people that we were serving. We were feeling it in, in our bodies. Um, and, you know, we changed things from, like, titles to the mission, to the vision, to what colors we were using in our branding. Um, I mean, it was, a, it was a state of just constant change every single day. And this is true today. We're still changing. The pandemic has really showed us how to shift as well. And even when people haven't wanted to, many folks don't like change, don't like new things, don't like to create new habits. And as a, as a society, as a whole, we've all have had to learn how to be in good relationship with change. Teachers do this all the time. They make a plan, they go to the classroom. I used to do this. One kid says something or is in a bad mood or brings something from the home and enters the space and you have to modify a whole lesson. You gotta throw it away and be able to, to uh, modify what you intentionally had planned, change it so it can meet the needs of your students. I was just talking to a teacher yesterday who said, you know, she just made, um, created a lesson, went into the classroom, a fight broke out. She said, I guess my lesson today will be about violence and how to deal with your emotions. And this is real. So I bring that up because this doesn't just happen in our space of uh, building an organization, the nonprofit space, but it really happens in many, in several places. Um, this, this, this ability to change and, and to adapt. We also, um, in, when the pandemic hit, we had gotten just some, some new funding from New Schools Venture Fund, and we had uh, planned out, you know, you write a lot of proposals when you're in a nonprofit. I mean, you write proposals, you write all the priorities, all the outcomes, where you wanna be in two years. It's very tedious. Um, and I often say to my co-founder and my team, it's like, Sometimes it means nothing because things change and you have to shift. And so we did that for this funding that we got in 2020. And pandemic hits, we were supposed to start a fellowship for teachers um, to help retain teachers in the classroom. And that went right out the window. And no, we had to pause for a month. And we took a month off to think, to deal with a new reality, to let it settle in, and then to redesign what a new program would look like. And thankfully, it is thriving, and we were able to start a new teacher pathway program that really supports teacher diversity in Rhode Island. So change is definitely going to happen all the time. I wrote something. I, do you know how many times I changed what I was going to talk about today? Like 30 times. And then I said, I'm just gonna get up there and I'm gonna practice emergence. And I've actually seen many people on stage. I sat here for about three sessions and saw people practicing emergence. Something comes up with technology, something comes up with their, their talk, they stop, they pivot, they change, and they move on. So it's gonna happen no matter how much we plan or expect to hope or set in place. We need to adapt to that change or else we become irrelevant. So I'm gonna, what a, oh, that says one, oh, I have one minute left. Ooh, okay, yes, all right. So I'm gonna leave you with three key takeaways. My intention in the beginning, I didn't name this, but was to stay a little bit longer to answer any questions that you might have, but we'll see how that goes. The three things are focus on the small, because small is good, small is all. Move with trust, so move at the speed of trust. If you trust the people, they become trustworthy. And change is constant. Be like water. These are just three. There are others that we use. Focus on critical connections, not critical mass. Less prep, more presence. I try to practice that all the time, even today. Um, and what you pay attention to grows. We know how to plan. We do it well. So now let's focus our energy on working in the context that's emergent. Because this is where 
we can begin to see the change that we want to see in the world. So I leave you with this question. How will you practice emergence in your organization or institution? That's it. I'm done. <laughs> and now it is time for an old fashioned downstairs at the bar. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hear you. <laughs> but I can take questions now, there, here, anywhere. So if you have any, if not, it's all good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.